Do you remember when Elon Musk launched a car into space? Ground control to major t- it is still out there, but it might not be in the best shape. It's not just peacefully drifting through a vacuum. It is hurdling around the sun at 63,592 miles per hour, being bombarded by solar radiation. That car might be in pieces. But not the same pieces it would be in if it was down here on Earth. The environment of space breaks stuff down differently. And the space debris a little closer to us, all the stuff that we humans have blasted into space and just left there in orbit, yeah, the unusual environment of space means that it too breaks down and degrades differently than it would have if it was just down here on Earth. But how long does it take to break down? And does it all break down? And how is that car looking right about now? Today we're talking space trash. In space pants. Look at my space pants. Very excited about that. There are a few different types of space debris. First, you have natural meteoroids. These are hunks of rock or iron in orbit around the sun, but sometimes pieces of them can get stuck in Earth's orbit too. There's also orbital debris. This is defined by NASA as any human-made object in orbit around the Earth that no longer serves a useful function. These could include old satellites, abandoned launch stages from rockets, paint chips, stuff left behind by space missions, or even pieces left behind when all of these things start to crash into one another. Orbital debris can be made up of all different kinds of materials, including things like polymers, like paints and plastics, metals and their alloys, oxides, sulfides, halides, carbides, anything that we send up in space could be out there. And a lot of it is in low Earth orbit, or LEO, where many satellites and the International Space Station also hang out. Now, it's a bit hard to conceptualize how much of a problem space debris is, because space is really big and a lot of this debris is pretty small. The majority of mission-ending threats come from debris between one millimeter and one centimeter in diameter, but estimates suggest that there could be over 100 million pieces of it out there. And as of June 2022, the Space Surveillance Network is currently tracking nearly 40,000 objects larger than a softball. Softball. But no matter the size, you gotta remember that this stuff is traveling at 17,500 miles per hour, zipping around us. If you launch a rocket into the path of a 17,500 mile per hour softball, you are gonna have problems. It's one hell of a pitch. And past collisions have caused damage to satellites and spacecraft. In the past, space shuttle windows had to be replaced after collisions with debris as small as paint chips. Things like the ISS even have to move sometimes to avoid crashing into debris. Just recently, in June of 2022, the mirror of the James Webb Space Telescope was struck by a micrometeoroid. Thankfully, it's built to withstand that and many more, because we know that collisions happen in space. Also, sometimes, whole satellites can just crash into one another, which feels like a thing that shouldn't happen. In 2009, two communication satellites called Iridium-33 and Cosmos-2251 collided at 11.7 kilometers per second. That is 26,000 miles per hour. The Space Surveillance Network tracked over 2,000 pieces of debris from that one crash alone. Since Cosmos 2251 wasn't active at the time, it's one of the events that has caused the space community to call for organizations to remove their old satellites from orbit when they've hit the end of their life. If it's not there, it can't crash into anything. And every collision that happens between debris can just lead to more debris. In 1978, Donald Kessler proposed a theory that describes a self-sustaining cascading collision of space debris in LEO, or low Earth orbit. That just sounds really bad. This theory is now referred to as the Kessler syndrome, or collisional cascading. It describes a situation where debris collisions create more debris, which creates more collisions, and on and on and on. The fear was that if this happened, the continued buildup of debris could make certain orbital spaces useless, dangerous debris fields. Thankfully, we don't seem to be headed in that direction quite yet. Now, some of the debris just falls out of orbit, burning up in our atmosphere. But depending on how far out into orbit it is, it can take a while for that to happen. Orbital debris less than 370 miles up usually falls back to Earth in a few years, but things over 620 miles up could orbit us for more than a century. And we're putting more stuff up there all the time, faster than the rate that it is falling back down to Earth. Now, if you leave trash just sitting out on Earth, it'll break down over time. So let's take a car, for example. If you let a car sit in a field for a century, it would 
look pretty rough at the end of it. Bugs might eat away at the leather interior, rain and fog would cause any iron parts to rust and crumble, the sun would slowly fade and then break down plastics. But there aren't bugs or rain in space, so the car wouldn't rust up in orbit, right? Surprisingly, wrong. There isn't water out there with the orbital debris, but up to 700 kilometers up, there is oxygen. And at that altitude, it exists as atomic oxygen rather than the O2 that we breathe down here. Atomic oxygen is just a single O, which is very reactive. So reactive, in fact, that things can start to rust even with no water around. The typical chemical reaction for rust looks something like this. You need iron, oxygen, and water. But the atomic oxygen doesn't need water around to start reacting with metals and creating oxides or rust. The oxygen atoms can react directly with metals on the surface of the debris. Things like aluminum and steel will form layers of oxides on their surface that cling on top and prevent further corrosion. An Earth orbiting car with a steel frame would likely be okay for a while. But iron and silver oxides can flake or break off and allow the metal underneath to keep corroding, eventually wearing away the surface. Depending on the conditions, a silver surface could lose between 11.5 and 300 micrometers of metal a year. That's around a hair's width a year. In the case of space debris, this wearing away could be a good thing since it could eventually remove the object from orbit. But for active satellites, this corrosion can be really damaging. So one way to protect components is to cover them in gold since atomic oxygen won't break down that gold. Plastic can also be broken down by atomic oxygen, so they too are often coated in more resistant silicone paints. And this is incredible. There is so much fast moving atomic oxygen and other reactive species crashing into objects in LEO that the collisions cause the emission of lots of short lived excited state species that emit visible radiation around the surface of whatever they're crashing into. Basically stuff up their glows. This phenomenon was first observed by astronauts aboard early space shuttle missions, giving it the nickname of shuttle glow. And it's honestly really beautiful. One of the most likely chemical players here is nitric oxide on the surface of the shuttle. Is this laughing gas we're talking about? When fast moving atomic oxygen hit nitric oxide on the shuttle surface, it may have created excited nitrogen dioxide molecules. Those could then release their energy as light and then become regular old NO2. Okay, total aside here. When trying to figure out how new materials will respond to the damaging environment of space, scientists can just stick them out into space and see how they do. And they do so on delightful little trays that look like this, each material in its own little cutout ready to be compared before and after flight. And I find it so satisfying because it is both incredibly orderly and also wildly chaotic considering that they're being bombarded by reactive oxygen and solar radiation. Just Love this so much. And that's another thing that a car orbiting around the Earth would have to deal with. Radiation. Down here on Earth, our car sitting in a field has all of the atmosphere and Earth's magnetic field to protect it from solar radiation. But out in orbit, above the atmosphere, orbiting debris is left unprotected. This can break apart carbon-carbon bonds in organic materials like fabrics and leather, some polymers, and carbon fiber. And that last one is important for our orbiting car because that Tesla Roadster up in space, it has a carbon fiber frame. So either orbiting around the Earth or orbiting around the sun, it is likely that its frame is looking a little worse for wear these days. In fact, at the time of launch, one scientist estimated that it would likely start to break down within a year. Atomic oxygen and radiation aren't the only things that space debris encounters. They also have to deal with things like temperature changes, vacuum conditions, and charged particles. There's a lot going on up there. And another weird thing that can happen to debris up in orbit is called cold welding. Here I have two pieces of metal. This is indium. If I press them together really tightly and turn them, they stick together. But it is more than just sticking. With nothing between them, some of the indium molecules from one hunk of metal have bound to some of the indium molecules from the other hunk of metal. They don't know that they're not from the same hunk of metal anymore. This is cold welding. When two surfaces made out of the same material collide and there's nothing in between them, not even air molecules, say like in the vacuum of space, they can cold weld together. Sometimes this can cause problems when surfaces on two pieces of a spacecraft stick together. This can be referred to as adhesion, sticking, or hilariously, stiction. 
Thankfully, this actually doesn't happen a lot by chance in space, since most stuff has a layer of oxides all over it, either from before launch or due to all of that atomic oxygen just flying around. So chemistry is breaking down some space debris, but it's doing it really slowly. A lot slower than we're putting more debris up there. So there are some physical solutions to space debris that have been proposed, things like satellites with grappling hooks to pull debris out of orbit, or big spinning magnets to move it around. All right, so finally, back to the Roadster. Currently, it is way out of LEO and orbiting way past Mars at the moment, so it's definitely out of the range of all of that oxygen. No corrosion fear there. When it launched, a bunch of articles came out saying that the radiation would rip lots of it to pieces, just like we talked about, tearing through those carbon-carbon bonds in things like leather, in fabric, in plastics, as well as its carbon fiber frame. And some people predict that the tires, paint, and plastic are potentially already deteriorated by radiation as well. But while there are a lot of processes breaking down materials in space, they're all pretty slow, so some experts have stated that the overall car will probably still be recognizable as a car for about a million years as it slowly breaks down. Unfortunately, the battery powering a loop of Bowie songs has long since died. There's no charging station up in space quite yet. Hey, no, no, we are not getting a copyright strike. You turn that off. We don't need that here. We don't want that on our channel. None of those vibes. Mm -mm. I mean, we want the Bowie. We just don't want the copyright strikes. Take Bowie any day.